now, and it's strange. So when you see all of this happening, and you understand the nature of the age that we're living in and the power of this body called Uranus and its ability to turn things upside down, then you find yourself thumbing through the book of Revelation saying, maybe I better take another look at this. You better be a little more curious, perhaps, than you had ever been before because you're living in a time where you have to admit, you get up in the morning and you turn a TV on and whatever to see, did it happen yet? I mean, everybody's waiting for God knows what, because it's gotten so bizarre and so violent. And now, last week, we looked at the beginning of the book of Revelation. And we came to some fairly, you know, obvious conclusions. And I don't want to go maybe into it as deep so that it would distract us from other things, but we have to visit it periodically because what we're, what we're finding is that Revelation talks about uh, things such as Armageddon, the final battle. And yet now we begin to realize that Armageddon is not a creation of God. Armageddon is a creation of us, you know. What I mean by that, Evolution into the, into the age that we're living now has progressed. And, and things, as you can see, have changed. And, and we're going to have to keep looking at everything. I want to look at that book of Revelation because there are some very specific, serious items in there. And I'm not looking at it based on the fact that it's religious because it's not. It's mythological, which makes it extremely important because the mythological studies of the other ancient parts of texts have borne fruit and proved themselves to be relevant in terms of science. And so what I'm saying to you, and in, in without a lot of gobbledygook, is there is ample evidence that the things that were written in these ancient documents were written by an intelligence not of this particular planet. Okay? The first thing... Well, if we recap just a little bit, is the most important aspect of the book of Revelation. And I think that you should consider it now because of the, the religious people that are on the war path all around you and uh, the fact that it would be good for you and your family to more or less really have uh, an understanding of what's going on and what might be uh, coming. When you start thinking of the book of Revelation, think of yourself, if you go into a, into a bookstore like Dalton's or some of these other bookstores, you'll find a fiction section. It'll say right up there, fiction. And then you'll, you'll go down the aisle and you'll turn, it'll say nonfiction. And then you go to the next aisle, it'll say science and maybe history and, and all this stuff. In other words, you have to determine the nature of the book that you're going to read before you pick it up, you know, you, if you're interested in fiction and, and you want to read a story, you know, you realize that someone who wrote that book made the story up. And it may have a moral attached to it, but the story is make-believe. And it, may, it could even be based on an actual event, but it's still make-believe. It's, it's not a true story. And it says here right in the beginning, say, hey, this is fiction. If you pick up a non-fiction book, then you're going to read something that has historical documentation attached to it. I mean, it, it has some place in history. I mean, it's a, it's a true story. It might be about the Kennedys. It might be about Lincoln. It might be a, a history. It might be about World War II, anything. But, I mean, it's something that actually happened. Say. So what, what category would you put the book of Revelation in? Certainly, it doesn't have any historical documentation. I mean, unless you know somebody with seven heads and ten horns and uh, well, all this kind of stuff. So there's no, there's no documentation connected with it. And it's filled with strange symbols. So you'd probably have to place it, if you're going to put it, you'd have to probably place it in the category of fiction. All right? But that would not be appropriate. And I'll tell you why. Because the nature of the 
writings are not based on a reasonable make-believe story, you know, like John met Marcia and Marcia met John and they got married and had a baby named Leroy and they went to work and all this kind of stuff. It isn't that, say. This book doesn't talk about that. It talks about beasts with seven heads and ten horns. There's a woman with stars in her head. There's angels throwing things down. Oh, there's Ethel in there. Pew! They all this kind of crazy stuff. Uh, and then, of course, there's our favorite, six, six, six. Wow. So the book of Revelation transcends fiction. And it also transcends nonfiction. They can't say it's true because it's not. It's not based on any kind of historical evidence. And you can't say it's nonfiction because it's talking in weird symbols. Everything is, you know, it's like, you know, it's like if you wrote some of your dreams, you know, some of the things you think. Imagine if we had on this board, we could put up here your thoughts, even right now. You, you would be the first out the door. Because weird stuff goes on in there. Right? And somebody sat down and wrote this book that we're going to have to put in a separate category. And I would say I'd have to maybe call it mythological symbolism. One cannot read any of it literally. You have to look at key words and symbols. That's what you have to do with mythology. Because mythology... Mythology speaks in terms of things went on and these people had conflicts with one another. And it seems in some instances that they're talking about a real story. But then there are key words and key symbols that jump at you. And once you've got the grasp of how to operate this, this key of knowledge in, in mythology, then you start to receive the message that's being covered up in it. And I'll tell you why it is covered up in it. The second part of the approach is to understand that the book of Revelation is written from a spiritual, and I don't even like that word, perspective. But it puts its emphasis on the invisible realm. Nobody really knows what a spirit is. I mean, it's something right outside of your skull and the nothingness that lurks around and whatever it does, you know. So you can find yourself really coming up with a lot of nonsense when you try to make sense out of this stuff. And that's what people do. The book of Revelation is speaking in strange symbolic terms for that part of you that is invisible. Not the part that you can see. There's a part of me that's invisible that you can't see. There's a part of you that's invisible that I can't see. I can only look at the visible part. And that visible part portrays to me what is going on in the invisible part. You know, you're an invisible person. You're an electro person operating a physical body. I'm an electro person operating a physical body. So you can see... The invisible part of me, which is really from over here, is operating this thing, communicating with you, and vice versa. And the book of Revelation is not intended to be intelligence for this physical part in which we, you know, exist on a lower plane, if you would, but for that invisible part. That's what it's written for. So you can, you can get a lot, of, a lot of crazy stuff when you try to make literal sense out of something as bizarre as this. And many people have done that, trying to uh, interpret the book of Revelation. And what they've done is they've taken it literally and figuratively. Oh, well, this part, see what it says here? The War of Armageddon. That's going to happen. Oh, the lady with the stars shooting out of her head. Well, you know, that's symbol. Well, you can't. You know, it's got to be one way or the other. If it's symbolic then the whole thing has to be because there's nobody in the book and there's no instructions in the book that says look you take this literally but you take that figuratively the beast with seven heads well you know that's not true but the armageddon that's true. and that's exactly what religionists have done armageddon 
the apocalypse has become a real literal thing, while the rest of it, they don't even know what in the heck it's saying. So they just say, well, that's, you know, something. And you can't do that. Either the book is literal, totally, or non-literal. It can't be both. Unless it specifically says, and it doesn't say that. So the book of Revelation then is interpreted by people at various periods depending on what is happening in their particular time. Don't forget, this, this book is written two or three thousand years ago. A couple of thousand years ago. And every time somebody pick it up, say, oh, look at this, 666. That must be Nero. He fiddled while Rome burned down. And what's going to happen? Armageddon, ah, the Greeks and the Romans are going to follow on the chain. Are gonna come. It all depends. Well, we don't even think of that anymore because now we, you know, who, who's 666? Oh, must be Saddam. Oh, and a couple of years ago, oh, 666 must be Adolf Hitler. Oh. Whatever you want it to be, it'll be. Whatever time you live in, you interpret that book of Revelation accordingly to what's going on where you live. And I'll tell you why. Because the book of Revelation is written not for what's going on out here, it's written for what's going on in here. Okay. And basically that's what it is. So you pick up Revelation, you look at it as a book of fiction, that may use some, you know, stories in its storylines. But it hides deep mystical messages for that invisible part of you. Now, let me just show you the, the, the um, part of Revelation that we looked at last week. Just for, just for a second. This is Revelation 1. John, your brother, companion, tribulation, kingdom, Jesus was in the isle that's called Patmos for the word of God, testimony of Christ. I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet. Okay? What does that mean to you? The guy's either on drugs, <laughs> he's drunk, he's had a wicked nightmare, he's as obviously totally spaced out, or none of the above, this is mystical mythology written to hide truth as to what is happening and what's going to happen and, and how life works. But here's the key words that we pulled out of there. The key word, you see, and this is the way you've got to read mythology of this kind. You can't read the storyline because that, we'll, we'll get to that, but you have to pull those things out that are important. And the things that are important here is the word... Patmos, okay, the word, okay, the spirit and the trumpet behind me, a great voice like a trumpet. So, so th those are the words that we, we, should, we, we looked at, so we looked at Patmos, okay, and, and we looked at uh, the word, and we looked at uh, the spirit behind me and the trumpet. Okay? And with those, we form at least our reaction to something that's being said to us that's extremely important. Because there's nothing here other than that that would be relevant to you at all. <laughs> there's nothing here relevant to you because it's thousands of years ago, but all of this stuff is relevant to you because it's today. Patmos here is a volcanic island in the Aegean Sea, all right? Using that location takes you to what? Using that location takes you to a place of water, the sea, and fire, the volcano, okay? Water and fire is the central part of the Greek mysticism and mythology. Water and fire are parts of the fivefold nature of the human brain mind. In Greek, th those fivefold points that feature water and fire are actually the very thing that 
we mistake baptism for. Uh, people dunk your head in water and they say, come out and then you're going to get baptized by the Spirit. Oh, I'm baptized in water. Then I'm baptized by the Spirit, fire, and all this kind of business. Water and fire are portrayed in this thing by the word Patmos. It is in the Aegean Sea, water, and it is a volcanic island, fire. Okay. Now let's take a look at Patmos. So let me just show you this in this next one. <coughs> Actually, it's a picture of it. It looks like a pretty neat place. Patmos is a small volcanic island in the Aegean Sea off Turkey's west coast. Okay. And it was where this book of Revelation was written. Now, when you take that word and you see that it's water and fire is the location, the very word Patmos, that root P-A-T means to stand pat. It means to stop. You're not going to do anything. You're going to stay still. You're going to be still in the place of water and fire. Okay, so, so, so that's, that's the important part. We're going to be still in the place of water and fire. All right. And if you are still in the place of water and fire and reach that level, which is called spirit, then from behind you, a trumpet will sound. Not bad. Now, here, here is, if we look at the next um, overhead, I'll show you where all this comes from. This is Greek. As I said, your New Testament is written in Greek. Your Old Testament became a Greek document in 300 B.C., and it was called the Septuagint. And it has five points in development of the human mind. Every, every um, culture has those five. And as you can see in uh, China, it's earth, wood, metal, fire, and water. Okay? In Greek, it's earth, water, air, fire, and then the renewed mind. So that's where we get baptism from. Baptism is the most stupid, ridiculous, asinine thing. And I mean, I don't want to mince any words about it. I mean, it's absolutely nonsense. Why? Because all you're doing and all anybody's ever done is gotten their head wet. Everybody in a, it's on death row in a, in a, in a penitentiary has been baptized. It means absolutely nothing. And the very Bible that people walk around with in Hebrews 6 says, now come to those mysteries of Christ, leaving again the doctrines of baptism. Don't do it anymore. Why? Because people are practicing the symbol instead of understanding. The idea of baptism is to take this head of yours, earth, bring it to water, which is the second level of consciousness, which you rise to in meditation, come up into the third level, which is air, where you separate from the thoughts of the mind, then you are touched by that fire, which is the fourth level of consciousness, electrically the spirit, and then you receive the renewed mind. In other words, baptism is not getting your head wet. Baptism is getting your mind changed. See? But uh, <laughs> we've missed it, and of course... I could get in trouble. I can't get any trouble anymore because everybody knows they think I'm loony anyhow. So I mean, what the heck? Why so I say whatever I want to say? <clears throat> Would it make more sense to you, though? There's a God somewhere that this God is more concerned with getting your head wet than getting your mind changed. Okay? And that's why Jesus says, John baptizes you with water. In other words, you enter in to that first part of your meditation and you raise your consciousness to that second level. Then you come up into the third, air. And there, when you reach the air, there is no thought. You are separated from the thoughts. All of the George Bush thoughts, all of the Saddam thoughts, all of the church thoughts, all of the IRS thoughts, everybody's thoughts are in the garbage can. And now you are pure in this virgin place. In this virgin place, you are in the air where there are no thoughts. And that's what it says in the Bible. And it says, we will rise and meet Jesus in the air. Well, do you know what Christians believe? They're going to shoot out of cars, and they're all buying convertible cars so that they don't hit the roof when they go up into the air. Honest to God, this is true. You go in Christian bookstores, and you'll see a picture of them. We're raptured. We're gone. And you'll see an empty car. They really believe they're going to fly up into the air. It's not what it means. It means you're going to rise into that third stage of consciousness, and when you do, <coughs> you will be touched by the fire or the spirit or the Christ consciousness. In other words, this is a serious thing. 
inside that takes place when you enter within, as Jesus said, when you separate from the thoughts of the mind, take no thought. When you practice the single eye, activate the pineal gland of the brain. When you watch, when you watch within yourself, and when you seek first the kingdom of God, which is within you. So that's the basis of fire and water. And you can see it, <coughs> again, water and fire. Even in Chinese, fire and water. And on the aisle where you still, you go to the place of water and fire. Where's the place of water and fire? It's inside of here. In you, when you go into meditation, you're going to Patmos. Why? Because I'm standing pat. I'm staying still. And I'm going to the place of water and fire. Thing. So Revelation is telling you that to have a deep, deep experience where secrets start to be revealed to you, where the revelation takes place, you have to go inside of yourself to that place of water and fire and be still. And then, then the revelation will take place and eventually the Armageddon will take place with that army inside of you, which is the electro power rejuvenated by your meditation, will meet on this field and overwhelm those thoughts which have caused the sickness and caused the stress and caused the anxiety and caused the hurt and the fear and the guilt and the violence. They would be defeated. So, it becomes a very beautiful thing. Now, there's one other thing that that says. It says you'll hear the sound of a trumpet from behind. Let's look at that again. We'll go to the next one. Okay? I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Okay, so we go into meditation, all right? And we go to Patmos, we went into the place of the fire and water, the higher realms of consciousness. We're still and we're waiting. And then behind you comes this great voice as a trumpet. There are two important points here. One of the points is the fact that there's a sound or a voice or a vibration, the trumpet. The other is it's behind you. Behind you. When you are in the place of the fire and the water we're talking about, meaning when you're in the place of meditation, the first aspect of it is the activation of what is called the chakra system, C-H-A-K-R-A, which do not exist, incidentally. Okay? Any more than spirit exists. That doesn't exist either. All of this is electromagnetism. It's invisible power, but it's good. You've got to call it something. I mean, you don't even exist. Your name's Donnie. You know, who gave you your name? Who says you're Joan? Who says you're Ethel? Some two people that came together and had sex one night. And, oh, God, I'm pregnant. What am I going to call it? Oh, I'll call it Ethel. Oh, I'll call it John. What the heck is that? So who says that's who you are? Nobody. You're you. I don't have any name. But you know what? We've got to have a name. Because if we don't have a name, how are we going to know to keep them apart? Who's who? <laughs> that would call them a name. <coughs> so you get a name. All right? And so then, here we are in this place of meditation, and we activate this thing called chakra. Now, this is a real thing. It's electrical energy which moves up resistors in the spine. Energy comes up the spine when you start this, and the energy comes up the spine, and it has to go through these chakras. It has to go through resistors. Why? Well, <coughs> if you have an electrical appliance, and if you don't have the proper resistance to the electrical energy, it'll blow your toaster right out the window. It'll blow your television set right up. Electrical energy cannot go unchecked. It has to be resisted. And so then the proper amount of electrical energy hits the brain. When it hits it, then it sets it up so that you can start receiving in the proper way the revelations from the right side. All right? Now, so they call them chakras. They say they're seven. Man, that's irrelevant. That's fine. I have no problem with that. But they're in the spine. Now, as the energy goes up the spine, it has to go through this electrical resistance. 
<coughs> Does anybody here know what the law of electrical resistance is called? Ohm. Say it loud. Ohm. Ohm. I mean, is all this a big coincidence or what? All right. A guy named Siegfried Ohm or whatever his name was invented this, or didn't invent it, but he discovered it. So they call it Ohm. If his name was Bernie Schwartz, what would you be chanting? You got it, Schwartz. That's right. And that's all irrelevant. The point is simply that as we go through this, the electrical energy has to meet that resistance. So it's in the spine. So where, if it's in the spine, where is it? Behind me. I heard something behind me. All right. Now, when you get into, if I get into things with, with Christian people, who I were one at one time, <laughs> boy, that was some wild stuff. I'm telling you, think it's wild now. Now that I'm, I, I've reached sanity. I mean, I was doing some crazy stuff. I used to do that. You don't know this, but for a while, I did a regular fundamentalist church. And people used to come up and I'd put my hands on their head and they'd all fall on the floor. And I remember looking at one guy one night and I said, this looks like Custer's last stand. It was bodies all over the place. But you know what got me? What got me concerned was when they got up, they were just as screwed up as when they hit the floor. So I didn't know. <laughs> and then I'll never forget, I, I, I thought I was pretty much a hot shot. You know, hit, touching people on the head and they're all, you know, passing out. Oh, God, you know. I've got it. <coughs> I'm really something. You know, when I was watching television, a Johnny Carson show, and he had the amazing Kreskin on. <laughs> the amazing Kreskin says, John, let me show you something. Bring some people up here to the audience, and he brings some people up, and they all get behind him, and Kreskin goes down, boom, 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 and they're falling all over the place. And I said, John, get out here quick. You've got to see this. Kreskin has the spirit. <laughs> I didn't know. I was, I learned. And then, and then when I, Joe and I, Ethel and I, we went down to the Sands Hotel in Atlantic City. And what we saw, says, well, what, was, what do they call these guys? Hypnotist. Hypnotist. And he said, okay, everybody, don't go, and it would be, he gets everybody lined up on stage, he's going boom, 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 and they're falling all over the place. And I said, Albert, he's got the spirit. <laughs> and so what we do, we take all these things and we don't understand what they're from. This self-induced hypnosis, you know, this power of suggestion that can cause us to fly. We don't understand these things, and so we attribute, attribute them to some divine thing or whatever. But so here then we have this thing coming from behind. And what I'm telling you here is that here's the way it works. Inside of you, like I talked about this Patmos thing, inside of you, the energy starts to rise. The electrical energy is then passing through the resistance ohm of the seven chakras. It then curves off to the right side, up to the right hemisphere of the brain where all of this happens. All right? Now, how, now what, what, when I would talk about this, and people would say, well, you're of a cult, or you're a Hindu, or whatever you are. I say, I'm nothing. I don't belong to nothing. I don't belong to anything. I don't join nothing. I belong to nothing. I don't want nobody to join anything. <clears throat> but, you know, and then I said, well, wait a minute. Your Bible that you kiss and put on grandma's piano and everything, it says the same thing. Oh, I don't believe that. And then, of course, then they, they leave. They don't want to. But let me show you, it does say the same thing. John, you want to? Here's Revelation 5.1. And I saw in the right hand, that's the right hemisphere of the brain, of him that sat on the throne, that's the highest consciousness, a book, that's the book of life, written where? Within. And on the backside. Sealed with seven seals. Of course, somebody might have slipped a Hindu page into the word of God. I don't know. But it's very possible. But nonetheless, there it is. All right. And what do they do with this? You know what they do with this? They don't read it. They don't go that far. It's on page 75. They go to 74, 76. But it's there. 
<coughs> so you see here <coughs> that the book is written within. So it has implications on what is the book written within you? What is the book of life written? There's a code written within you. It's called DNA. It's a human genome. And some people die. Some people get sick because there are pages in the book which have been tampered with or distorted. And the cells in the body come up for class and instruction and the cells get in front of the body and they read and the cell says, you go here. And the cell says, I always went there. What happened? They want me to go there? I'll go there. And when he goes there, all oh, hell breaks loose and he gets sick. Because the, the words have been damaged. So the book is written within, so it has implications not only from the standpoint of contact, it has implications from the standpoint of DNA. So in meditation, the energy or the power or the sound comes from behind. What is sound? It's vibration. It's really nothing. Do you know what's happening when I'm talking? Little things in your ears are going like this. Like that. And those little things in your ears going like that are sending electrical impulses. And when they send the electrical impulses, it unscrambles everything and it comes out to you out here and says, ding dong, dong ding. Whatever it is. Say, oh, that's a pleasant sound. It is not. It's your ears vibrating that way. Little hairs in there. It's all disgusting stuff, but nonetheless, <laughs> that's what it is. Right? <coughs> so how do you hear <coughs> this vibration coming behind you? This electrical vibration comes behind you. And you know what's so good about this? It's very consistent with science. That's why I can show it to you. If I, if I would not be able to say what I'm about to say if I wasn't able to prove it. Because the one thing that I said when I started this thing, if I can't prove to you, then I won't say it. And so I can prove it. And that's what, you know, to me is exciting about this stuff. I want to bring up uh, something and show you here. Look at this. Science is from the New York Times. Not the kind of thing you find in a smoke shop or anything like this is New York Times. Listen closely. From a tiny hum came the big bang. You know what it says? That the big bang that created you and created the stars and created the planets was caused by a hum. Have it? Can you hum? So I hear you hum. Um. Wouldn't it something if it exploded? <laughs> this isn't a lot of bull. These guys have heard this. They've recorded it because it finally, after billions of years, reached the planet Earth. It, creation was caused by a hum. Now, Revelation says, I heard behind me like a trumpet, a vibration, something that creates inside of you. I mean, why, why, why go picking up the Bible and saying I'm a Christian and I'm going, oh, if you don't pay attention to this stuff, or it doesn't make any sense to anybody. What's good is it? Well, I just have faith. <laughs> when I'm going to die, I'm going to heaven. But why make a hell out of what we got here for the rest of us? I want to stick around. What about you? I'll tell you what. Everybody that can go and see Jesus, okay? Everybody wants to go and see Jesus. And you all do. You can see him in a couple hours. That is a magnificent offer. The only condition is we have to shoot you in the head. <laughs> I just line up in the hallway. And you know what? Nobody will go. Nobody wants to go that bad. I, I really am not that interested. I'll pass on this. <laughs> I'd rather go see Jimmy Buffett, to tell you the truth. <laughs> of course, because it's not true. 
Jesus says at that time, you know, I am in you. I am inside of you. If I want to see Jesus, I go in here. I don't have to die. Let me, let me, let me, uh, let me um, go to the next thing. I blew the thing up a little bit so you could see it better. The new observations do not see the quantum fluctuations, <laughs> but instead have found traces of colossal waves. Get this. <coughs> Much like sound waves that set in motion the roiling young universe. Sound waves set in motion the young universe. Now, you can see when, when people try to translate the, the book of Revelation into contemporary happenings, you know, and, and you got all this going on, it's something you don't want to listen to. And I don't really care if Hal Lindsey, this guy made millions of dollars selling a book to like Great Planet Earth, and he's a nut. I mean, the guy is absolutely wrong, totally wrong. <clears throat> How can I say he's wrong? Because I can say he's wrong. Because, you know, just common sense tells you he's wrong. And it's always conditioned on this fear thing of we're going to have a war. The power of invisible meditation, and I mean by that separation from thought and entering within yourself, is where the book of Revelation is translated for you. Let me show you something in Overhead 9. Look what, what it says in here. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in the book. Send it to the seven churches and all these places. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? That looks like that could be taken literally. Whatever you see, write in the book. You can come in here tonight and say, well, I went in there. This crazy person up there was saying all this crazy stuff. You wrote it in the book. But there, look at the first thing. Uh, alpha and Omega, what's that mean to you? The beginning and the end, the first and the last. You know what I'm saying? You know who, you know who Saddam and Osama, and let me tell you that is? Allah. I am the beginning, Allah. I am the end, Allah. I am in everything. I am all, Allah. See, I am in everything. I am everything. And that's why only through meditation in this invisible realm of nothingness will that come to you. Because you're speaking of that which is all and permeates everything. And you can't translate something like that into what Saddam's doing or what George Bush is doing or atomic bombs or all of that stuff. You can't. It's way beyond that. Far beyond the ability of a, an individual with a human mind to understand this. Look, sounds reasonable. Got to write a letter to the churches. Forget all that stuff. Because we know, we've agreed on this, it's a symbolic book. Look for something there. Look for something there that's going to alert you. How many churches are there? The seven churches are right here. The seven resistors. The seven churches connected to the seven seals, connected to the seven beasts. It's the number seven that takes you beyond reasonable instructions given to communicate with churches. Take what you see, but not with these eyes. Take what you see with the single eye. Take what you see with the pineal gland. Take that. That's your revelation. See, this may be your Armageddon. If Armageddon takes place in you, <laughs> it's going to affect me. And if Armageddon takes place in me, it's going to affect you. And if Armageddon takes place in all of us, then it will affect the world. Because then the armies, which are the power of the right side, which is called in the Bhagavad Gita, the sons of Pandu, will overcome the armies which are on the left side, which is called in the Bhagavad Gita, the sons of the blind king. And when the sons of Pandu overwhelm the sons of the blind king, then we can all see. And then we can realize that the way that we live and the people that are directing us to live is not what God would ordain, is not what spirit would ordain, and is not something that we should be following. We are the electrical power grid. 
that operates in an invisible world <coughs> and generates what we see via the single eye. And then when I see it in the invisible world through the single eye, which you don't see physically anything, then I translate it through the physical to you, and you translate to me. So I see what's going on in your invisible person from what's going on in your physical person. Let's take another look at that, just for a second. Let's have next one. Again, the same thing. Write in the book what you see. see. What you see. Consider that this writer saw many strange things, didn't he? And look, this is one of the strange things that he saw. Look at this. <coughs> mm. And I turned to see the voice. You know, I remember it came from behind him. I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. And I saw seven golden candlesticks. Not six, not five, not eight. And in the midst of the seven, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. This guy... <laughs> On a sight, his head, his hairs were like wool, white as snow, his eyes are flame, his feet fine brass, burned in a furnace, his voice is the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth was a sword. Now, what if you went to the police station and told him about that? <laughs> Officer, I really saw this. <laughs> yeah, Leroy. Uh... <laughs> and, and so once again, we know... <coughs> If it's a lunatic, then we have no business even picking the book up. But if there is something deep, deep, deep contained in there, because we see the number seven, the candlesticks. We see the seven stars. We see the sword coming out of the mouth. We see the golden girdle. We see not one bit of this is reasonable. Not one bit of this can be speaking of a physical person. But it carries symbols that are consistent with other passages in the book. So when the writer is told to write down what he sees, it becomes obvious that what he sees is either the product of some kind of bizarre stuff that he ingested, a mental breakdown, or a deeply symbolic message that goes way beyond common sense to communicate something that is known and should be known by our invisible person out here. Thus the ability to write books explaining all of this defies logic. Now, just for a minute, take a look at this. And I turned to see the voice that spoke, and I saw the seven candlesticks. Notice that he turned, because the energy is behind, like we discussed. The electrical energy flows through the spine to the brain. That's why the turn is made. See? And as soon as he turns... <laughs> he sees the seven candlesticks and again suggesting to us the seven chakras or the seven nerve centers of the spine. So here we are alone on this island and you come, like when we come in here on Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock, we're each one of us an individual Patmos. Each one of us, is, as the lights go out and it's dark, we're alone, we're on this island of water and fire. And there is that place of the five stages of consciousness and meditation that we read about and we're shown this electrical energy will generate up the spine and encounter those chakras or resistors, and a new electrical energy will then touch the brain. You see, there's a form of electrical energy that'll turn those lights on, and there's a form that'll blow them out. <laughs> there's a form that'll turn this projector on. There's a form that'll turn your radar range on, and everything has to be adjusted so it turns on proper. Because if it's not the proper... <coughs> then it won't turn the appliance on. Inside of your head, there's an appliance. And when just that right amount of electricity touches there, it'll flip the switch and turn it on. And then you'll see. <laughs> then you'll know. Then it will be revealed to you. Huh? So those things, those nerve centers, those resistors, those shockers have to be operating properly because what's been flying up there for so long 
has been electricity that is not proper to turn on what has to be turned on. And so that's what he turns around and he sees. Okay. And the rest of the thing, the feet like brass and all that, goes far beyond reason. And it's not even any need to discuss the rest of it. <clears throat> because it's an obvious reference to God and, you know, so forth. We know the Bible says there's light and conjures up. But there are two points there worth looking at. Look at this one. <clears throat> His voice as the sound of many waters. Did you ever hear that? Think of Niagara Falls, you know. Wow, the sound, the, the torrents of, of water. Now, why would I single that out? I would single out the, the, the sounds of many waters because I guess you could think of Niagara Falls, a roaring kind of sound. I want you to look at what physicist John Kramer of the University of Washington in Seattle says was the sound that created the universe. Now, look at that. No, no, go back. Go back. Just the top. Look at this for a minute. He looks and it's the voice as the sound of many waters, which means it's a roaring sound. Now, now go. The Big Bang, that's the creation, sounded more like a deep hum than a bang, that's home. According to an analysis of the radiation left over from the cataclysm, physicist John Kramer of the University of Washington in Seattle has created audio files of the event, <laughs> which can be played on a PC. And he says, the sound is rather like a large jet plane flying 100 feet above your house in the middle of the night. Okay? Can you imagine? That's, th that's what we're talking about. And so then, when, when, when the scripture says, I turned, and the sound was like, you know, water, a roaring water, a roaring sound. In other words, it's just talking about that this is, this is the aspect, this is the vibration, this is the energy of creation behind you. When you're in that place of stillness, in the place of water and fire, when you're in your meditation, it will happen, it will come to you. It's not going to shake you, it's not going to hit you like a jet plane, it's just talking about the energy is such that it is a creative energy that will inside create that new person in you by throwing down the obstructions from the left side and opening up yourself to the true reality of who you are and what lies. Just, uh, just think, just through your head, where you are, just a little bit of skull separates you from where you came from. A couple of feet. Now the second point, I don't know, is there another, what's the next one? I don't know if I'm supposed to go to the next one or not. The second point, yeah, okay. Well, it's the same thing, but I mean, <coughs> he had in his right hand. Which hand did he have? His right hand. You know what the right hand means? The right hemisphere of the brain. Seven stars. Well, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance like the sun. Now, many times we've covered the Bible's emphasis on the right side. It is referring to the right hemisphere of the brain. Okay? The star, we're going to be... Next month, the star of Bethlehem. And the wise men come from the east. Why do the wise men come from the east? Because whenever you look north, east is always on the right side. Okay? And what it's saying is that when the child is born inside of you, of the virgin, which is the stillness of the mind, purged and purified from any stain of the thoughts of the left side, when that occurs inside of you in your meditation, then wisdom comes from the east. Wisdom comes from the right side. Revelation comes from the right side. The wise men come to the new child inside of you. That's what the story is about. It's a beautiful story. It's not something that physically happened. More important than that, it physically happens. Every day can be a Christmas story because the virgin mind can give birth to the child right in the midst of the animal nature of the stable where all of the ranting and stomping and screaming and all that stuff goes on. 
right in the middle of that stable of the animal nature. Can the virgin give birth to the child and the wise men can come from the east? But what has to happen first, the shepherds that are you have to be watching. The sheep, which are the thoughts, and then all of this occurs. So it's what it's about. So in other words, it's, it's a real, true, beautiful thing that happens inside of you, if you like. So here the power, vibration of sound emanating from the back is connected to the seven and to the right side. A little further along, we're going to the next area, which deliberately tries, <laughs> you know, a lot of these, and a lot of these stories, they deliberately try to misguide and mislead. That's the techniques of, of ancient mythology. If you're playing seriously, and you're willing to go inside of yourself as Jesus instructed and make this happen, then you'll know. And you'll understand this stuff. But if you're not, if you want to follow the church, if you want to follow the pastor, if you want to follow all of these people, violence and everything, because that's our tradition. I was born this way, I'll die this way. Good. If you want to follow that, then you're going to read this stuff literally because it's going to de deliberately deceive you into thinking. And that's exactly what Jesus said in the Bible. He says, I do this deliberately because seeing they don't see and hearing they don't hear. And I don't want them to. This is not stuff that's given to people who are of the left and of the lower. It is only those who are willing to go inside the instruction has to come from inside. It cannot come from outside. It cannot come from a book. You can read every book that's ever been written, and I can guarantee you that the guy that wrote that book knows more, no more about what actually is the real existence of God or truth than you do. Everybody's got an opinion. <laughs> but you have to go to the place where there are no opinions. When you go into that place of fire and water and you close yourself down and you shut off the thoughts of the left side, there's absolutely nothing. What kind of opinions can there be when there's nothing? What kind of prayer can there be when there's nothing? Somebody's asking you to go in and pray. Everybody's asking you to be still and listen and receive and allow that light to enter into you and to generate that electrical energy that will cause that mechanism inside of you to open so that you can then receive. You won't have anything in common with these people out here. And that's what hurts people more than anything. God, you know, I'd, I'd want to do this. I'd really, but what would, uh, you know, my brother say? What my aunt